Be careful. He's hungry. Hopefully he doesn't spit at me. All right, country number 153, Uzbekistan. Two hours on the border, finally made it. One, five, three. Hi, this is Hamada and welcome to Final 50, where I travel to the last 50 countries on earth. Today we're in Tashkent, Uzbekistan in Central Asia. And we're gonna check out this incredible capital and then go and see the Silk Route from the main cities that formed this incredible route across Asia and Europe. So let's go check it out and see what this country has on offer. So Uzbekistan's known for its cotton since the Russian Empire started and brought cotton here, actually diverting water from the Aral Sea into Uzbekistan for its cotton. But I wanna show you the cotton, how incredibly soft and awesome it looks. It's not often do you get a chance to see cotton right there. Pretty cool, right? On the first night I was in the capital, I decided to go for a long walk since the weather was magnificent and the city was so alive. Summer nights in Tashkent can get to like 80 degrees and the Uzbekis really take full advantage of it by basically having all these crazy awesome outdoor activities that I bumped into and stumbled on just walking through the city of Tashkent. Really, really awesome place. This is a great example of Uzbek innovation and the new Uzbekistan with this TV tower, which is called the Tashkent Tower. I woke up the next day and I knew I wanted to do everything I could to maximize my final day in the city. So I had to be as organized as possible. Here's a life hack I've developed over 25 years of travel to maximize your day while still leaving some experiences to chance. Planning your day you want to kind of lay everything out maybe like in a notes like you know apple notes and just kind of write down all the highlights you really want to hit then kind of compare that to a google maps and then see where each one of these places are and then the idea here is that then you can try to strategize the best place to start and where you're going to progress on each part of the journey for a day now remember the key thing here is that you don't want to over plan because you want to leave something spontaneous but by the same token, you don't want to underplan and then leave something out. The metro stations in Tashkent are known to be among the most beautiful in the entire region. So I went out and made a day trip out of it. So the Tashkent metro system was created in 1977, largely backed by the Soviet Union, because at that time, if you reached over a million people in a city, then you qualified to have such a public system built. Now, the system has since grown to three lines that are around the whole center of the city. And what's awesome is each station is unique in its own right. Some are about commemorating space travel, some are about commemorating history and times, some are just beautiful, just like this one over here in the center of the city. Uzbekistan is a secular constitutional republic, but that being said, 90% of the people here are still consider themselves Muslim and are strong adherents to the faith. In fact, it's so infused in the architecture, the values, and the history of the country. So I thought, given today's Friday, I'll come and pray in the Jum'a prayer here in the Minor Mosque, which is one of the more beautiful mosques in Tashkent, and frankly, in Uzbekistan. <laughs> That's probably the largest Jum'ah prayer I've ever seen or ever been a part of. It's just a normal Friday prayer. There are literally thousands of people that came from everywhere for this prayer, which was a little bit longer than I'm usually accustomed to, but really incredible. It's such an experience. Wow. Central Asians take their bazaars very seriously, and the main one in Tashkent was no exception. After Friday prayers, that was my next destination. So here's the Charsu Bazaar, which is in the center of the old town of Tashkent. Really cool, unique dome, and then adjacent domes where they have all kinds of necessities and people come here all day to buy stuff. So let's go check it out. In each one of the different locales, you'll find fruits, vegetables, souvenirs, all kinds of cool stuff. So I think this is a fig. 
and I have to try it. Love fruits. It is a fig. Mm. So sweet. Yummy. It's hot, so I needed another ice cream. Way too hot out there. So this is a madrasa, a center of learning, which was super important in Islamic times and has persisted throughout. In fact, it turns out that Uzbekistan has almost a 99% literacy rate. And these were the old, old madrasas where people used to study pupils, especially really in theology. While as you saw there is an amazing metro system and plenty of buses and taxis, I found myself walking around most of the city to get a better feel of the vibe and interact with the locals along the way. Oh, and oddly enough, most of the taxis and streetcars are Chevys, since these cars are manufactured in the country and run on gas, which works out well since Uzbekistan is one of the largest exporters of gas. Amir Timur, Timur Lane, is revered in Uzbekistan for being able to reconquer and breathe life into the region. And what's amazing about him is that he was really ruthless. I mean, he committed genocides and so forth in the countries that he took over to almost as far as China and into Turkey. But what's really amazing about him is that he revived the Silk Route. He wanted to have trade between China and Europe and really be at the center of it. After racking up over 30,000 steps on my tour of Tashkent, my local friend Mir Jalol recommended that we eat polov, the national dish at his favorite polov restaurant. Okay, I'm here with my boy Merji, who I recently met in Tashkent and is going to be taking me hopefully to Samarkand. Um, and he brought us to a restaurant that's known to have the best pilaf in all of Central Asia, which is a huge statement since everybody in Central Asia loves pilaf. But I'm going to show you how cool this crazy kitchen is and how to actually prepare the pilaf. Now imagine during the holidays, this is what they would be using. While I loved my time in Tashkent, my true mission was tracking the Silk Route, which ran through several key cities in the west and southwest of the country. By way of background, the Silk Route stretched a total of 9,000 kilometers from China to Western Europe, and it started as a route to trade silk for horses, and later became a thoroughfare trading in philosophies, commerce, religions, innovation, all of which facilitated the rise and fall of civilizations for over 2,000 years. So I was super pumped to start this part of the journey to really see the historic side of Uzbekistan. All right, taking a plane and heading to Kiva right now. I'm spending the whole day there. I really want to maximize my time because it's known to be almost like an outdoor museum. So let's go check it out. We're here to explore the city of Kiva a city that was created over 2,500 years ago in southwest Uzbekistan and has been taken over by so many conquerors and dynasties, whether it's Greeks or Persians, Turks or Arabs, whether it was the Mongols or the Russians. It was sacked and resacked and resacked, but has still survived the test of time. And what I really love about it is that really it was at the crossroads of the Silk Route. What I'm gonna do is gonna walk around the town, see all the beautiful architecture, all the beautiful sites, uh, and kind of show it to you in terms of what it offers and why this place was so magical and known as an open air museum. It's not a shock that here in Kiva has one of the oldest madrasas and one of the largest madrasas in Central Asia. Remember, in the Silk Route, not only did they trade goods, but they traded knowledge. People came and learned theology and other disciplines. It's still functional because they made it into a hotel called the Orient Star. Each one of these former classrooms became a hotel room. Pretty uh, standard room and kind of expensive, but still an interesting experience to stay in Kiva in a madrasa. I mean, just think about the history of something and an experience like that. 
Now what's cool about the minaret behind me, and it's probably one of the most iconic minarets in all of Uzbekistan, is the fact that it was built to be about three times the height of what it is now, except the Khan who actually tried to build it and was in the midst of building it, died in battle, and the next Khan was like, forget about it, I'm not even gonna bother investing in this thing. And they topped it off, I think, at 29 meters. But it's still such an incredible example of the architecture of the period, the Islamic architecture of the period, and the blues and the hues of the colors used for this incredible minaret. So Kiev is known for its artisanship and wood carving craft here in the city. And there's no better example than this mosque, which is held up by about 218 wooden pillars that really kind of showcases the beautiful wood carvings that these artisans are able to create. And it's such a nice quaint mosque here in the center of the old town, that you can really get a good feel for the culture and the history of this beautiful city. There are so many nooks and crannies and little rooms and alleyways throughout the city. I'm kind of curious to see what's behind this one. Look at this guy right here. So this is like a local camel. They're shorter than the ones we've become accustomed to in the Middle East because they graze low. Carrots, cotton nuts or something to that effect. But these are the ones that are from the region right here in Uzbekistan. This place is truly an open air museum. I mean, there's just so much to see and explore down these little alleys. It just feels like a complete blast from the past. And get a good example of how it must have felt to be here during the height of the Silk Route, except it would be bustling market with people everywhere. Now it's a little quieter, but it's just so well preserved and you get just such a good sense of what it felt like to be here so many years ago during the time. Nevertheless, there are about 3,000 people that still live in the old city walls of Kiva, plying their different trades, dancing in the streets, and thriving as they once did in its golden era. So you, you're saying that you, that you guys live in the city, in the old town, in but the, then in that- the fortress. In the fortress. Winter, snows, and summer, it's hot. It's hot. Yes, 40 degrees. 40 degrees, huh? <laughs> All right, an eight hour train to Bukhara. When was the last time you had to go on a train for that long? I can't even remember the last time I did this. I'm going to relax, get some sleep, and I should be there by midnight. Wish me luck. Truly the journey was just getting started when I boarded that crazy train along the Silk Route. So make sure to join me in part two as I explore the fabled cities of Bukhara and Samarkand, where I climbed a hidden minaret, met a rising star, and even crashed an Uzbek wedding with Mirjalol. Oh, you've got to see this train. I'm going right back into the Soviet Union. <laughs>